uh, usually a story starts with uh, once upon a time. <laughs> so once upon a time, long time ago, 97, 1997, I was traveling and I went to Tibet of all places. So I'm from the Netherlands. The Netherlands, uh, the Dutch are usually very tall because we live below sea level. And every morning we check if the water is coming in. So that's how we, you know, over many years we grew tall. And so I thought, let's go to a safe place up on the roof of the world, Tibet. Um, I ended up there purely by chance. And I was very lucky because on the first day that I arrived there, I met a young lady and uh, she was in the dormitory opposite of mine. And when I walked in, I nearly stumbled over a king. And I asked her if she was there for sightseeing and she was very, you know, kind of, no. Nope. And I was, uh, well, it was logic because she's blind. So it was a very, very bad joke. I was happy she didn't beat me up with a white cane. She had a good sense of humor. And, uh, but then she told me her life story and it has changed my life. And it has changed a lot of people's lives. Wow. And that meant that over time she was going to go blind. So Sabria went to regular school. The parents didn't tell her that she was going to go blind. And that was a good thing because uh, I think, I guess most people still believe that blindness equals darkness. And that's a myth, right? Because uh, a blind person sees as much as your toe in your shoe, nothing, <laughs> right? It must be very dark that shoe, but if you take your shoe off, the toe still does not see anything. So Sabria was um, uh, bullied when she went to that regular school because, uh, you know, that, that's what happens, right? And I always feel sorry for both for the people that bully and for the people that are bullied because the people that uh, bully have to bully. <laughs> that's a sad story itself. So, but I feel more sorry for the people that are bullied. And so Sabria went uh, home and she stayed at home and she didn't want to go back to school. Then her father read some books to Sabria and one was of Angela Davis. And I'm sure that some of you have heard about Angela Davis. Angela Davis uh, started the Black Power Movement in the US and there were three words in the biography that was black is beautiful. And this is something that, you know, for Sabria, you know, as young as she was, she didn't understand, of course, the full meaning of it, but she thought, oh, if she can transform black into something that's being negative, right? Or, or inferior to something positive, I have to find the beauty of blindness. And for Sabria, and this is, this is um, for her, she also thought black is blind, blind is black. And then she came up with four points and she said, I should not look at what I can do similar to sighted people, but what is my advantage of actually being blind? That's a very big transformation, right? So she came up with four points and she said, one is focus. Blind people are not distracted by Hollywood, Bollywood and advertisement. That's a blessing. Right? Advertisements are meant to, you know, first of us, that first of all, that we look. But the second thing is that we feel bad. <laughs> We're a loser. We don't have that product. So uh, advertisement affects lots of people in a negative way. So blind people are not uh, distracted. They, are, they can focus. Second one is communication skills. Blind people have to be very precise in their language. They cannot point anymore. Right? They cannot point fingers. They can say two meters in front of you on the second shelf. That's where's the cookie, where you find the cookie jar. Third one is problem solving. If I would blindfold any of you now and say, nobody can help you, let's see where you get. You have to solve the problems of not being able to see. And this is basically what they constantly do. And the last one is vision. As a blind person, you have never seen, and I always describe blindness as reading a book, right? It's the closest, is because it's about imagination. You read a book, The Beautiful Prince, on his horse, you know, goes up the hill, sees the beautiful princess in the castle. That's something that you picture, right? And of course, what you picture, if it's real or not real, if it's, if it's you know, it's, it's your imagination, right? So and what happens when you go and see the movie that has been made from the book? It's disappointment usually, because, you know, it's not the beautiful prince that you had in mind or the beautiful princess, right? It's, uh, that's what the director's choice was. So when Sabria was um, understood that she had actually advantages over sighted people, she took the next step and that was very, very key. And then she said, I have to find, I have to take my life into my own hands. I think that's a big issue, you know, especially for people in Asia where there's a lot of pressure on your youth to do something for families, to do something for society. So, but she said, okay, I have to take my life into my hands. 
it's the Marburg for, for the mind, and focused on the ability and ability now. The driving easy downhill skiing, it uh fine people can you imagine? Right. So this was a big boost for Sabrina South Conference. And at one point they uh, went to an exhibition about that. And Sabrina became immediately interested and she said, Wow, this is something beautiful. Why why can can I study this? Is there a study about this? And so they said, Well, forget about it, you're blind, you cannot do this. And this is something typical where most people are very good at is to tell other people what they cannot do, <laughs> right? So they, they're not uh, looking at how can we help? No, it's like, forget about it, right? So immediately uh, things are being stopped. So I hope that's not gonna happen again. I'm, I'm in a remote area, so I don't know if that's, uh, hopefully it's not gonna happen again. So um, so they focus on the abilities. And so Sabria um, got a big boost and she went to university, but she couldn't take down notes in Tibetan language because there was no braille script for Tibetan language. And earlier I meant that blind people, you know, I mentioned blind people are good problem solvers. So within two weeks, Sabria developed a Tibetan braille script. And this was seen by the Tibetan scholar and he took it to Tibet and there's a lot of blind people in Tibet. And they said, who can come and teach? And he knew Sabria and he said, oh, well, ask Sabria, she will come. And no, that's not possible. Uh, you know, like uh, she's blind and a woman. So Sabria said, I have to go alone. So she traveled alone to Tibet in 1997. And I must say, she got a lot of applause for that, but she spoke the language. I also went there, you know, and she could ask around, right? <laughs> and then she was helped because she was blind. I will also went there. Really because, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a logical thing for certain people. To know, but, uh, so Sabria was there and she told me her life story and that she wanted to start a school of blind in Tibet. She went on a horseback trip through Tibet and she found lots of blind children locked away in dark rooms and they were left there to die. It's very terrible to see and it's still happening in remote areas where people don't know. They think that blind people are possessed by demons. Parents wouldn't even touch them um, and or they have done something wrong in their previous life, which is terrible. So luckily for Sabria on this trip, she met a little boy's name is Tenzin and Tenzin smiled at Sabria and said, oh, you're blind, I'm blind too. And Sabria was wondering, how come that this boy has this confidence? And here are the five steps that are absolutely key, not just for blind kids, but for everyone. Tenzin had a task. He was the yak herder. If you have a task, you have value. If you value, you usually respect it. If you respect it, you get dignity. And only if you have dignity, you can get to self-confidence. Now, a lot of people never make it to dignity. And that's not, you know, their fault, but it's usually the expectations of society at large. Right? I mentioned earlier the, the women here in India. I feel very, you know, uh, uh, with them because they have to get a good study and have to uh, get married before 25. They have to have children before 30. Otherwise, they really, you know, they can forget about life in India, right? And it's all, and and these these uh, rules are set by society, and it's it's uh, very hard to challenge that. So, Sabria so said, "Okay, I know what to do. I have to start a place where we can bring these blind kids together. They gain skills. They get through." You know, they, they build up this true confidence and then they integrate themselves into regular schools. So she told me this story and I became interested and I said, you know what, uh, let me know when you start the school and uh, I'll join, you know, we do this together. So about a year later, Sabria called me up. She was in Germany. I was back in the Netherlands and uh, she called me up. She raised some funds from the German government. and She said, next week I'm going back to Tibet. Bye. German, very direct, you know. So I said, um, I didn't say anything actually. <laughs> I was waiting, I was, I was thinking, and um, then she got a little, uh, you know, she was a little angry. She said, well, we don't know each other that well. Uh, you know, at least you can wish me luck, you know, don't cry. <laughs> and then I said, you know what, I'll join you. So the next day I quit my job, best decision ever. And five days later, we were in the plane back to Tibet. That's where a lot of challenges uh, were waiting for us. We didn't know uh, beforehand and that was good. So first one was we were kicked out of the country again, had a wrong stem and the wrong page, risked our life, had to go overland to Nepal. It was very, very, very challenging. Uh, there was a big flood at the time. So I thought I'm going to be safe from the water, but then that was one of the biggest floods ever in 98. Um, but we survived that trip. We went back to Tibet and people tried to uh, steal money from Sabria. Um, and the biggest problem we had was not all that. Biggest problem, how can we give hope to these blind children? 
See, for me, my personal slogan is life is what you're happy getting up for. Life is what you're happy getting up for. If you're not happy getting up for something, then there's something wrong. And you can start pointing fingers, you know, but that's three fingers pointing back. And okay. see, if you're not happy once in a week or once in a month, that's fine. But if that happens on a daily basis, you should ask yourself, what's, what's wrong and what can we do? So um, biggest problem, how can we give these kids hope? And we found a solution and the solution is still working till today. And it changed, I would say, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or even millions of people. We started a very, we had a very simple solution. And I think if this would be done worldwide, um, we would be in a different world. We, the most important question in life according to us, and you may disagree, but is what do I want? What do I want, right? If I have to, changes to I want to, that's where the magic begins. We travel a lot, we talk to a lot of people, and we ask them a question, what do you do? The answer is, most cases, students say, I have to go to school. Other people say, I have to go to work. So there's a force that forces them to do something that they don't feel like they want to do. Now, if we can, you know, if we would ask our kids, and that's why we started this dream factory, we asked our kids to dream and to dream, you know, big. And it doesn't matter if they can or cannot do it. Just, just give it a go and see what is it that you really want to do. It's a very difficult question, but hey, let's, let's get some, you know, get something going. So we gave them two weeks time. And here's Norbu. Norbu is eight years old. He smiles wildly and he says, I want to become a taxi driver. <laughs> now, in a normal setting, what would happen? The parents would probably smack the kid and say, you dumb kid, you can't believe you're one of mine. You know, <laughs> something like that. And they would destroy their dream. You're blind, you can't do this. And, and that's the problem. So what I believe that I have no right, and I think nobody has the right to destroy anyone's dream. Now, just picture a world where we would listen to people's dreams and ideas and we would think of what and instead of boycotting that or immediately say no to something, use the energy that we use, you know, that we normally would have wasted in a negative way. Let's use that to find solutions to say, hey, how can we make this happen? And of course, having a blind kid driving a taxi is going to be very challenging. But hey, why, why immediately say no? Right. But the biggest the bigger picture was Nobu was happy because we said, wonderful, that's a great idea. He's eight years old. What does he know? Well, he has 10 years before he can make a driver's license anyway. So let's see what's going to happen. So he was running around, happy little kid. Two years later, we had a, another dream factory with new kids coming in. And Nobu was there. We said, Nobu, what, what is the, you know, what's the status of your, uh, your dream? And then he said, well, now I realize the fact I can't see, it's not so safe to become a taxi driver, but I can set up a taxi company and run it. He's 10 years old and he got it. He never, he never did that. Uh, two years afterwards, he changed his plans again. And that's great. You know, we kept dreaming and he became interested in making cheese. And I was the happiest person on the planet because the Tibetan cheese, the chura, these are hard little, you know, like the, the teeth breakers they are. And so he was the first blind person ever in Tibet to fly. And he flew all the way to the Netherlands. And he learned to make cheese. And he came back and he started our cheese factory. This is more than 20 years ago. Then he uh, started a restaurant and a medical massage clinic. He's successful. Why? Because he does something that he loves doing. It's that simple. So... At the time, Sabrina and I, we had a dream factory ourselves because we started this very spontaneously and we had no clue what we were doing. <laughs> and sometimes it's good to get some structure. So we were kicked out of the country again. We were sitting in Tamil uh, in, on the top of Helena's Kitchen Restaurant. And we said, okay, what's the next four years? What are we going to do? We're going to start a preparatory school for blind kids. They learn everything so that they can integrate themselves into regular schools. We're going to have a vocational training farm. And our students already said what they wanted to do. Animal husbandry market gardening, a bakery, cheese factory, compost production, knitting, carpet weaving, uh, music, and medical massage. They had lots of professions that were not even done anywhere with blind people on the planet. And we got to start a braille printing press with Tibetan, Chinese, and English braille books. There was no software, nothing, but we said, that's what we need. So first we say, what do we need? We've solved the problem later. Okay, <laughs> I have to slow down, I'm going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um so we had we had these uh, big plans 
uh, we were actually quite proud of ourselves because we put it all nice on a piece of paper and we said, now we need money. Um, we said, okay, we, we've quickly learned a lesson and we said, if you have big plans, don't go and present it all at once to potential donors because they shake their head. They go like, who are you? We were, we were late twenties when we started this and they said, who are you? You know, you are, you're an engineer by training. Sabria is a university dropout. What do you know about setting up schools for the blind in Tibet of all places? Tibet is a very, very difficult place. So um, it didn't take us four. So we didn't give up. We, we went, we broke it down in bits and pieces. For the cheese factory, we went to the Dutch uh, embassy and they were happy because they love cheese products. The bakery, we went to the Germans, the German embassy, and they gave us some funds. The Canada funded, uh, gave something. It didn't take us four, but six years and everything went well. And our kids went to regular schools and they were kicking butt. Our kids were prepared. So they, they were prepared to go to schools that they spoke English, Tibetan, Chinese, they learned math, they, they walked with their canes, they could serve on the internet. And then they went to schools that were outside of Lhasa and they spoke better English than the local uh, English teacher. And the headmaster, after one week, because he was very hesitant to take our uh, students, after one week, I said, please, please, one week, and then you call up and if, if it doesn't work out, we'll take him back. And after one week on Friday, the phone rings and it's the headmaster. And I was like, oops. And then he said, do you have more? <laughs> I was like, whoa. I said, what, what, do you have more? And I said, yeah, we have more. Was, uh, he said, well, I said, what happened? Why do you want more blind kids? And then he said, well, your kids are good. And now our sighted kids, they, they are not that good. <laughs> and they don't want to be beaten by the blind kids. So they, the level in the class went up just because of diversity. That was, of course, wonderful. And so we, at that time already, we knew that we can't stay in Tibet forever. The Chinese government was, uh, you know, stopping all foreign uh, projects. And we knew at some point we have to, you know, we are going to be asked to leave or not to continue. We lasted 19 years altogether till 2017. And then, unfortunately, everything ended. Um, they left our schools open for one more year. But then they close it and it's very still so very painful. Because we knew already back then that this is not going to last forever, we said, okay, what's next for us? And then we looked uh, in our history and we looked at the, you know, at the situation of the world. Um, we looked first of the need. The need was there for our students in Tibet, the blind students, to go to an international institute to, uh, you know, for leadership so that they can basically, you know, get all the skills and tools so they can take over our role as directors of the center. So we looked around in the world and we didn't find anything that was practical. And then we said, you know what, we've done this for you know, seven, six, seven years at a time. And we said, we've got to start our own center. That's how the center that was, we, we first called it the International Institute for Social Entrepreneurs, terrible name, uh, was born. And luckily, uh, we use this now as uh, in one of the sessions about naming, we use it as a bad example and luckily one day uh, we had lunch and Sabria was jumping up and she was like what was that what was that and our colleagues they started laughing they said are you bit on a cantari and a cantari is a very small but very pungent little spicy chili it's one of the spices in the world and if you bite on it you go you know it's it wakes you up better than coffee can um it, it is it is very very uh, powerful it lowers your blood pressure um, it's very healthy, and we said that's the perfect symbol for change makers. Change makers, right now, two words. That's not good. Let's talk about Kantari Gandhi, Kantari Mandela. Right? Hopefully, that's the future. So we said that's the name of our organization, Kantari. Now, at that time as well, we 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 did something, and I think this is absolute key for all of us to do on a regular basis, and that is sometimes to zoom out. I see a beautiful picture of the of the planet Earth. And that's exactly what we should do. Sometimes we have to, you know, step back a bit, look at that, you know, far distance, a nice, nice chance. So see, because we're on that planet and we're all on that planet, right? And, and nobody's gonna leave soon. Uh, Elon Musk is trying, but I think we're not gonna get there that soon. So we have to clean up our mess. And what we notice is if you turn on the news at night, the newsreader worldwide starts with two words usually, and that is good evening. And then you watch the news and five minutes, 10 minutes later, you scratch your head and you go like, wait, 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 is it good evening? <laughs> What's the man talking about it today, right? So um, 
we're, we're in, in a pretty situation right now. And I think that we can do better. I'm ashamed that right now, as we are speaking here in peace, there are millions of people going into factories manufacturing weapons. What is worse is that these weapons are being used. And what is even worse, and you can't imagine something worse than that, but there is one thing that is worse, is that tomorrow, these millions of factory workers again go into these factories and try to make even better and more efficient weapons. That's, that's where we are. And I'm ashamed that we, <laughs> we can do better. I'm 100% I'm sure that we can do better. Now, we, we gave this a lot of thought back then and we said, okay, uh, who has to make it better? Who are the right change makers? Because we have tons of people that talk and talk, but they don't, there's no action, right? I see a lot of people, and especially now in, in the day and age of, of social media, they're all self-promoters. It's about I, 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 iPad, iPhone, I, I, right? And I think right now, one of the biggest problems in the world that we face is that the I is in front of me, in front of us. And if we can't reverse that, I think then it looks pretty bleak. You know, the future looks pretty bleak. Um, we have to reverse that. The, I, the, the we, the us has to be always in focus. We can't be independent. People tell, you know, a lot of people, they talk about independence. They say, I want to be fully independent. I, I don't want to be fully independent. And I tell you why, because if I would be fully independent, I would not be able to talk to you right now because I don't know how to set up an internet. I don't know how to, you know, I would be possibly, you know, most probably be on some farm now growing food so for me to be, to be able to survive then i would be completely independent but i want to be independent in my thinking right? but that's a different story and that's also you know being limited more and more around the world so so who are the change makers that we need to you know solve problems uh, that we are facing now so we found them we found them and it was not very hard to think about who they are we focus so our our goal change from within and change from within means that someone has been affected by social or environmental ill that's a person that knows what it is to be in a position of you know being sidelined of being you know discriminated of of having you know felt the negative effects of whatever is happening on our planet and those are the people that we focus on so it's called change from within we focus on people that have been gone that have survived or you know, gone through um, issues and problems that were that that really affected their lives so badly that they said, "Stop! Now we have to do something." Now I'll give you a few few examples quickly. It's uh, we work with ex-child soldiers from Sierra Leone, Liberia, and they are now making peace building projects. We work with people with albinism from East Africa. And in East Africa, usually they are being killed and chopped up in pieces and their body parts are sold as good luck charms. And the hand goes for $75,000 right now for witch doctors. So they go back and they campaign against the killing of people with albinism. We work with a lot of women that have seen uh, domestic violence and rape. They now work on women empowerment programs. So we have sons of farmers who kill themselves using uh, pesticides drinking pesticides and the sons they came to our organization they got skills and they got back and started organic farming <clears throat> so it is it is a change from within so the change from within and this is the big difference with usual you know the traditional uh, development work you know or the the, the top down, down approach from the westerners and that's why I'm always the first thing I tell people in India when I meet them. I said, I'm not in India to change India. <laughs> that's that's I, I wouldn't dare to. Right. Um, and I think that's something we, we should really be careful about if, that we want to tell anyone from another culture what they should do is right or wrong. Uh, they need to do that themselves. And the, 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 the issue is they need tools and skills for them. That's that's basically what Kantari, where Kantari comes in. What we said to our, um, ourselves was what cause and what skills we could have benefited from tremendously when we started in Tibet in 1998. And then we said, okay, now is there a curriculum that we can learn all these skills and tools? And we didn't find anything worldwide basically that was doing that. So we said, okay, we have to make our own. And that's how the Kantari curriculum uh, came about. So it's all about uh, experiential learning. 
Um, I give you two examples of what we learned in Tibet of experiential learning. And it started with our little kids, the four, five, six years old. So we had the mouse class, the rabbit class, and the, um, and the tiger class. So the mouse class were the very young ones, four or five years old. And then we had the tiger class and then the rabbit class. And so the, the older kids, they would go to bed at like 9.30, 10 o'clock. The younger kids, they had to go to bed at 7. And they protested because they felt we are big too. They're like four or five years old, right? So, and they said, and then they asked us, um, we want to go to bed later as well. And we said, okay, great. Then you go to bed later, right? But then you can't go to bed earlier, right? Now we reset the new time. It's 9.30 or 10 o'clock. And then you go to bed for 10 o'clock. This lasted three days. And after three days, they came and they begged us and they said, can we please, please go to bed early? <laughs> because they understood that they were very tired during the day. So we said, okay, well, you said that you wanted to be late, you know, please, please, please. So we let it know for two more days. And then we said, okay, fine, you can go back to seven. But from now on, it's seven. And that stayed. Um, dishwashing. They didn't want to wash their dishes. They're all blind kids, right? So then we said, okay, fine, then we don't wash dishes. So after one or two days, the, all the dishes were used and they were in the corner and they were all dirty. And then the rats came and our kids, they were like, nah, the rats, we don't like them that much. Shall we wash dishes? And they said, well, you didn't want to wash dishes. If you now want to wash them, remember, then we should do this on a daily basis. Otherwise, the rats come. The dishwashing, no more problem. So basically, it's that letting people experience you know, a situation and they will, they will adjust accordingly. So in um, our organization in, uh, in Kerala, we came up with a fictitious country. And in this fictitious country, we give people a lot of challenges and it feels real. It's called Tanzalesia. And it feels so real that some people really think they are in Tanzalesia. It's, uh, there's a little bit of information. I can't give you everything because then, you can, <laughs> then we give away too much, but it's a very exciting time where people experience a lot of problems and issues. Um, the, the reason what for us is important, the most important reason is that um, the change comes from within. Now, Jane Waitera, who is from Kenya, is a person with albinism. And four days, this was in 2009, she was in our course. And four days before she went home, we read an article that a four-year-old girl with albinism was killed in her village. And we said, Jane, we can't let you go home right now because you're being chased. And next week, we read in the newspaper, you're being killed. And this woman, she's like a lioness. She said, I have to go home. <laughs> I have to stop this. And see, the good thing to change from within is that she could go home and say, we. We people with albinism shall not be killed. And it's not an outsider that says, hey, stop killing each other. She knew the problem. She was affected herself. She knows the context in which all that takes place. She knows the history. She knows the culture. She speaks the local languages. She has the contacts, you know, uh, in the local setting of police and protective system, etc. So who better to make that difference than Jane Waitera in Kenya? Right? And that's the approach that we have. So we really focus on people. They go back and make a difference within their communities. Now, um, I give you a few stories and, and for us we work with very very special people and Sabrina and I, we feel very rich that we are able to be in this position so all we do basically is share what we learned over all these years we've done this now for 26 years uh, we had 15 years of Kantari uh, programs um, we already trained 280 change makers in 55 countries they started more than 180 organizations uh, and on, on a daily basis, 50, 60,000 people, new people benefit from that. Um, I give you five stories. And um, it's, it's for me, every, every story is, is special, but we have literally you know, several hundred stories that are special. But uh, start with one, Joshua. Joshua and Jacob, in 1998, I was with Sabrina, we bought all the houses in Tibet, one of my birthday, 12th June finals of the World Cup and it was uh, Brazil against France and I wanted to see that match and we had to carry our horses for a long time and we were in the middle of nowhere and my goal was to reach a little village where there was a TV and I, my hope was that it wasn't raining so it was raining the horse wasn't carrying me but in the end we saw that game in the middle of the night after that game we went to bed and everything was fine but at the same time in Cameroon there's Joshua Jacob Joshua was eight, nine years old at the time. 
His father had just bought a car and they came back from a public viewing of the match. And he was very excited because Zinedine Zidane, he scored two goals. He was his, his big idol. On the way back, they got robbed. Armed robbers came. They asked for the money. And the father gave the money to the robbers. And they still, <laughs> they still shot his father. He was killed in front of him. So Joshua was, uh, and his brother, they survived. And they grew up in an orphanage. And Joshua in Cameroon, where there is a conflict going on, there was a war going on saw that in orphanages, the situation was absolutely terrible. There was not enough food. If there's not enough food, kids can't study properly. So he started an organization that call, is called Peace Crops, not Peace Corps, but Peace Crops. So he teaches, you know, he, he goes into orphanages and they learn together how to grow, you know, food so that on one side they learn a skill but on the other side they have something to eat which improves you know their their future and he works on peace building because right now the conflict is still going on and regularly when i'm in talking with him he says let me go in or let me call you back because the bullets are flying right so these are people and again he has been affected he's a big guy he's been threatened several times his family member was um, uh, so several family members were killed some were kidnapped and he faces these situations and yet he keeps going and a lot of respect for the guy. Um, we go to India, Jochna Das. Uh, she was with us in 2013. Jochna is a lady um, who was beaten up by her husband so badly and, and really ill-treated for a long time. And one day she said, this is it. So she took her kids, dropped her at her sister and um, went into the fields. She found a well that was 30 meters deep. She looked around and she didn't see anything and she jumped. She was double lucky because there was enough water to break her fall, but not enough to drown. And the double luck came that uh, Gauri Shankar, who later also came to our organization, uh, who was a child rights activist, from the corner of his eye, he saw this woman jump in that well and he saved her life. So in her dream speech, and this is what happens usually in December, the uh, participants speak for 10 minutes and then they get 10 minutes question and answer. They share their life story. She said, you know, when she was giving a dream speech, she said, the only reason why we're here today, this young man, <laughs> she was pointing at, uh, at Gauri. And after that, she left and she has now trained more than 5,000 women in skills so they can um, gather some income and they become less financially dependent of their husbands. They work in small groups, and this is in, uh, in Orissa, and usually when a woman doesn't show up, they know that the husband most likely has beaten them up again. So the police doesn't do anything because they say this is domestic. It's not our responsibility. So they have small groups of women, they go back with baseball bats, and they talk to the husband and they said, one more time, and we're gonna beat you up. And in this way, they take their rights in their own hands, but they definitely stop the, the amount of violence that's been going on. And of course, they, because they have some money now, they spend that money on getting their kids to schools. So hopefully that vicious cycle of violence can be, uh, can be broken. Um, so we had, uh, well, Jane Watera already uh, told a little bit. Um, so Jane is, is now very well known uh, as, as the person to stop, uh, you know, the killing of people with albinism. We have other people with albinism from Southern Africa. And see, in Southern Africa, there's also a big issue because if a man is HIV positive, he believes that if he sleeps with a woman that has albinism, he gets cured. And if they want to sleep with him or not, that doesn't matter. So they can also be raped. <laughs> so these things are going on right now as we are speaking, right? So we have several people, they try to stop that. So a lot of them, they get um, uh, skin cancer anyway, you know, a lot of these uh, people with albinism. And if they are raped, then they get HIV positive and they either die of cancer or, um, or of skin cancer. So, but we have people that go against this. And that's, that's, that gives hope. Um, there is a, this year we have another woman, uh, she's from uh, Cameroon, uh, very powerful. Um, her name is Solange. And Solange has been raped when she was 14, 16 again. She got pregnant. Um, she had to, she got the baby and then she wanted to report the rapist. And because the war is going on, there's no police system as such. So she went to the elders and the elders decided, well, the father has to live with the baby. So you have to live with the rapist. 
for two years she stayed with the man and then she left him with a baby and now she came to us and she has the goal that rape should be a word that can only be found in the dictionary and it should be a word from the past and last one as an example is Anumutu. Anumutu is also a special character he was with us in 2017. Anumutu is from Pondicherry uh, he lost his father when he was five years old and he became a child laborer and he had a terrible youth when he was 11 or 12 he was picked up by an organization and they trained him as a graphic designer and a photographer and um, so there was one issue and that was with Alamutu, he his heart basically he lost it with people that are on the streets and in Pondicherry you find a lot of people that are dumped on the street and he always had to go to them and you know take care of them and he had several people who died in his arms and he had to bury them single-handedly so what happened is he found out why the people are on the street and it's usually all the men and he found out that their own children dumped them there because if they would bring them to the hospital daddy is sick he's old he's going to die anyway so it's better to dump them and hopefully somebody's going to pick him up so anamutu we had one problem with his story because he was a child laborer, but he was never on the street. And then we said to him, okay, so what can you do? Because you're still that outsider that comes in from, you know, from as a top down approach and say, you poor guy, I have to help you. So he said, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try what it means to be homeless. This was in 2017, around this time, it was in November. It was when there was Oki. Oki was a typhoon that was coming in. And he went for three days, he went on the railway station and he came back and he was devastated. He was crying a long time. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, I've never been so hungry, so cold, you know, and, and so thirsty. He said, but that wasn't the problem. He said, I became invisible. On average, there are 3,000 people that walk through that railway station day and night, per hour, every hour. And he said, and nobody saw me. Looking away is a choice. And I think that's where right now in the world that we are in, uh, a big issue. And we're all looking away. If you watch TV, you have a remote control. If you're on your computer, you have a mouse click and you know we see things and we, we don't know what to do. It's overwhelming. But I think what we should not do is look away for people that are in situations they did not choose to be in. Right. And if you can't give anything to a homeless person, you should not take away their dignity by not looking at them. Right. Just give a nod. You say hi, smile, do something. And I learned I learned that the hard way, too. So <laughs> and see, we, we all need each other. Right. And I think that's where we can we can make a, a big difference if we start. By not looking away and, and again, listen to each other to see what what are the issues at hand and what can we do um, to find solutions? Yeah, I, I see so many people complain and they, they're, they're yelling at other people and they, they are, it's either they're envious of other people that have more, right? It's, it's, I think it's, there's something wrong with us in, inside. And, and I always wondered what, what, uh, where empathy comes from. We did a talk at the neuroscience department once in, uh, in Princeton. And afterwards, we asked some of the, uh, the scientists and we said, uh, I asked them, I said, where does, is there any research done of where empathy comes from? Right. We have children that have um, uh, HDHD, right. So attention deficit, you know, hyperactive uh, syndrome. And what do we put? You know, Ritalin. Yeah. A bu bunch of Ritalin we put in. So we, we chemically, you know, we solve this. In America, if you don't take Prozac, you're not normal. Right. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, people have they're depressed. We pump Prozac into it. So could it be that empathy could be, you know, if it is a substance, if it is a lack of hormone, is it a lack of I've got cramps yesterday. So I took some magnesium. Right. So there's there's some issues. Is research being done? And I asked them and apparently not much. And I wonder, would, wouldn't it be fantastic if we can have a little pill that gives people empathy? <laughs> right it's uh that, that would be a quick quick fix i guess but uh i think till we get there i think we have to uh try to show empathy for each other and help the bullies as well right because the bullies need to bully and why because they never made it to dignity and that's why they don't have their self-confidence uh, to stand up and and you know face it that maybe 
they are not as good as others, but what can they do to become others that are better, right? And I think that's something that we can do on a, on a daily basis. Um, I look at the time here. It's, um, see, the symbol that we have, the, the chili, oh, two more things. One is we are in the center of the world now, and that's a good thing. So everybody says, why did you go to Kantari? Why did you put it in Kerala? And actually, it's the center of the world, and people start smiling here, especially the Keralites. And, uh, but then if you look at uh, the world map and you have Trivandrum, which is the south of India, and you put a circle around it, you got Australia, Asia, Africa, uh, Europe, and Africa. And in that circle, the center of that circle is Trivandrum. And in that circle, there's 85% of the human population is in that circle. So we are in the center of that. And that's, there's no other place on the, on the planet where you can have the same you know, amount of people, <laughs> the massive amount of people in that circle. So we are very central. Um, I, I want to open up for, for Q&A. Uh, and there's one thing, though. Um, see, sometimes, and you must have heard this, that when you have ideas to change the world or to make a difference in the world, people will tell you, ah, come on, forget it. Uh, who are you? You're only one person, right? What can you do? Well, I hope that now from the ones that were here from the beginning, they know that a Chile is a very, you know, Cantari is a very, very small Chile, but very powerful. So now you can tell them, okay, just bite into a Cantari and you can see that a small Chile <laughs> can make a huge difference. And I think that's the Chile in us. Let's discover the Chile in us and make the difference that is needed. All right. Thank you. Oh, I see the chat box. There are no questions in the chat box. Anyone with a question? Don't be shy. <laughs> How can I do so? Okay. I think, see, we don't have to travel around the world to find a problem to be solved. I think the first thing is to uh, show empathy for whoever is in your neighborhood, right? Um, Ask your neighbor, see, imagine if everybody would ask the neighbor in the morning, how are you? <laughs> if everybody would be doing that, right? We, first of all, we would not find people dead after 20 days <laughs> because nobody cared, right? Um, I think the problems, are, problems to be solved are very close at home. They are literally in your own street. Yeah? And everybody looks great, you know, from the outside, but every house in, in Holland, we say, Alec Huis heeft een kruis. And uh, so every, every home is carrying, you know, some issues as well. And I think that's something that we, uh, we, we have to be open for. And, and yeah, I think everybody can do something, right? Um, um, one, one small story I want to share. A good friend of ours is Rupert Neudek, unfortunately passed away several years back. Rupert Neudek was the um, person that started Cap Anamur. I don't know if you know or remember the Vietnamese Bo people. Right now we have the trans, you know, the, the African African, but uh, this happened to the Vietnamese in the early 70s, 80s. And he saw this and he saw the little ships on the news, they were drowning. And then he said, I have to do something. And that's his slogan, you have to do something. So what he did, he went to Singapore, he rented a boat, a ship, like two or two hundred meter long ship, the Cap Anamur, and you can look that up on online. And he started to save lives of people, uh, Vietnamese uh, people that were, you know, these little boats, you know, trying to flee uh, Vietnam. And so several years back, I think eight or nine years back, he had a stroke, and he was in Germany, and he was uh, carried to the hospital, emergency, uh, you know, operation. And then he woke up, and the doctor came to him, the surgeon, <laughs> and the surgeon said, "Well, Rupert, he." Call him by his name. He said, um, "You saved my life, you know, 20 years ago. Now I saved yours. Now we are even." So Rupert was uh, <laughs> the surgeon. Was one of the people that Rupert personally took on board. I think that um, his example, you know, like his example, is so strong. You have to do something. He saw something far away from his reality, right, in Germany. And he said, we have to do something. And he did, he acted, right? He, he, and he was not a fundraiser. He didn't know how to do all that stuff, but he just did it and it worked, right? And now the Vietnamese, um, uh, I would say the Vietnamese community in Germany still is, you know, highly, you know, respective of him and they celebrate him every year. They, they, uh, they, they have a day where they honor him, right? And that's, I think that's a great thing. And it doesn't have to be as big as that, but we can do something, right? Chrissy has a question. Mm. Chrissy, can you unmute yourself and speak? 
yes. Um, thank you uh, for for all these insights. And I'm uh, I was very curious if uh, there is anyone from uh, India in this panel, maybe Rima or mm. anyone. Uh, uh, I would be interested to to listen the opinion of of a person that uh, lives in India. I, how how they feel about this because i'm from greece for example and um because i work for vulnerable um, social groups i'm a social pedagogue and so it would be very interesting to have someone who reflects on my country about this and then i would like to have a say so i would like to have an insight from an an Indian woman or man. So, if it is possible, hi, Chrissy. Um, I live in Mumbai, which is I mean, you see a lot of these things which are happening around. But to be very honest, I feel very helpless, and I don't know at times how to help or how to act in these situations. Um, we do try and take certain actions, but I don't know if they are enough. Yeah. How do you feel about what you heard? Do you, do you feel that um, embarrassment? Or do you think, do you feel uh, it is true? Do you feel lucky? Um, it's, I don't feel a lot of embarrassment because I do work in the social sector many ways and I see how I can be of help to try and, um, I wouldn't use the word uplift, but empower those individuals with the gifts that they have to share. So I do work with certain tribal people who are living in India. And yeah, but it's also, it's, I also feel extremely helpless because I don't know how to help the other things that are happening around. So, yeah. I, I think maybe one thing, right? We all, we have this network, right? And I think um, if we feel helpless, I think they're, they're reaching out to other people and say, what do you do? Right. What can you do in certain situations? And see, I'm, I'm the wrong person to tell what to do in India because I'm not Indian. Right. I think that's something that really has to go from the local, you know, like community to share. And we have we have quite a number of Indian uh, graduates. Um, also, there are a few in Mumbai. Um, and it's, if you look on our website, you can find some people. And if you uh, see them, I'm happy to connect you to them as well. And so networking, I think, is a, is a, is a big thing and, and sharing. And what we've noticed for founders of organization, there is uh, it's very hard to talk to others if they haven't founded organizations for the problems that we face to really share that, right? Because it's, it's you, you have to deal with your beneficiaries on one side, your donors on the other side. Um, you have to deal with the, the politics. You have to deal with the local authorities. You know, there's many, many parties that you have to keep uh, aligned and, and uh, I would say um, in, in, in a good form and shape. And that's not always easy. And to share experiences with that with other people that have uh, founded organizations, I think is very valuable. And I have one request and that is, see for us, um, especially in India, uh, for next year's course that starts in April, we have received more than a thousand registrations from around the world, but mostly from Africa, hardly any Indians. And so, but also other countries like uh, um, Spanish speaking, uh, Central America, South America, Southeast Asia. We are looking for, for a bigger diversity. This year we had 13 countries. Right now there's 23 participants from 13 countries on our campus. And the, the bigger the, vari the variety is of different cultures, the bigger the learning. Right? So if you could help by sharing uh, the message, if you're on our website, we have a poster and it says missing change maker. <laughs> so it's like, a, like, a, like an alarm thing. It says reward uh, scholarship. 
<laughs> so, and it uh, carries a plan for social change, 22 uh, years or older. We don't have an upper age limit. Uh, this year, we have a 66 year old baby from uh, Zimbabwe. She could not get children and was stigmatized because of that. And she wants to help other women that can't have uh, children. And she wants to start an orphanage uh, because a lot of children on the same side are uh, abandoned. And we don't mind if she's 66 because she wants to do something. So for us, everyone that has an idea that uh, to carries, you know, that carries a plan to make a difference is welcome. I want to say something. Um, I really, really want to thank you, Paul, for let us feel the pain of these stories of your students. It's very, very important to feel and to take action, you know? So it's a, a, it really touched my heart. No, it's, so thank you. See, it's, it, it's unfortunately, you know, the stories that we have is the reality for, I would say, a, a, the larger part of people on the planet, right? Because we, we, we don't see that, but, you know, the, the people that are in war zones now, the people that have been displaced, right? We have a lot of people in internal displaced camps, um, the domestic violence, um, loneliness, yeah, just just people that are lonely, other people that are lonely in, in so many places because of the you know the social social media. But I feel it's not very social, is it? Right? If people uh, are separate from each other, and I think it's um, going through you know uh, going through hardship, and and if you make it through some of the hardship, there is no other option than to do something, right? Otherwise, it's resigning, and we should never resign. <laughs> That's the that's the that's the worst option, right? It's it's in the end we have to do something. And and Rima, like you said, and I'm I'm, I'm happy that you say that you feel helpless as well. But I feel, you know, try try to find other people that have you know that 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 might be able to give you a few ideas of what could be done, maybe on a you know in your direct surrounding, right, or on a personal level as well. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. I'll try to get in touch with more. I'll try and network with more people around. And if, if anyone comes to Kantara or to Kerala, please feel welcome to, to, to visit us on our campus. Mm -hmm.